The first half of August 1942, in the Bible, we are told that the walls of Jericho were brought down by the mighty trumpeting of horns by its besiegers. On August 9, 1942, it is the German besiegers of Leningrad who have to face the music when a live performance of Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony, the Leningrad Symphony, blasts across the city, sending a bombastic signal of unfaltering resistance to the Nazi forces. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the last weeks of July 1942, the Holocaust went into overdrive as the Nazi killing machine reached the levels of mass murder laid out in the plans presented at the Wannsee Conference in January of this year. This is now Operation Reinhardt, named after its main architect, the late leader of the SS Sicherheitsdienst, Reinhard Heydrich. Every day from now until November this year, the SS will murder 14,000 men, women, and children, almost all of them considered by the Nazis to be Jewish. While the world is still unaware of this uptake in the rate of atrocities, the news of previous mass murders has been trickling out into the world news outlets for months. Days before Operation Reinhardt went into full speed, on July 21st, a group of Jewish organizations held a mass demonstration against Hitler atrocities in Madison Square Garden in New York City, demanding adequate action to defend the threatened Jewish communities of Europe against new assaults, to secure support for the self-defense of the Jewish community of Palestine now endangered by the common enemy, and to strengthen the assistance of the Jewish community to the United Nations in their wars upon the Axis. Whatever the result of that call for help will be, it will be too late for, among others, the many forced to live in the Warsaw Ghetto. On August 7th, Abraham Levine writes in his ghetto diary, The 17th day of the massacres. Yesterday was a horrendous day with a great number of victims. People were brought out from the small ghetto in huge numbers. The number of victims is estimated at 15,000. They emptied Dr. Korzak's orphanage with the doctor at the head. 200 orphans. He's speaking of Henry Goldschmidt, better known under his pen name, Janusz Korczak, a renowned Polish-Jewish educator and pedagogue. He ran a Jewish orphanage in Warsaw before the war and stayed with the children when they were locked up in the Warsaw Ghetto. Ghetto chronicler Emanuel Ringenblum describes Korczak's last journey as defiant. It wasn't going to the wagons, but a silent, organized protest against the regime of murder. The very paving stones wept at the sight of this procession. But the Nazi murderers hit out with their whips and fired shots every few moments. Janusz Korczak, holding a child by the hand, led the way. With him were the women, childminders in white aprons, and behind them 200 children, clean and tidy, their hair combed, going to the slaughter. By August 15, all 4,000 orphans of the Warsaw Ghetto are dead, murdered by gas at Treblinka. They make up less than 2% of the 220,000 Jews of every age from all over Europe whose lives are ended prematurely by the Nazis in their murder machine during the first two weeks of August 1942. But it is not only the Jews who are the target of Axis murderous brutality. You will have seen in Indy's weekly episodes back in April that the United States Army Air Force, USAAF, carried out the Doolittle Raid in which 16 B-25 bombers launched from an aircraft carrier to carry out a no-return bombing run on Tokyo, killing 50 and wounding a couple of hundreds more. The crews continued their flight, trying for allied China or the Soviet Union, but some ran out of fuel before crossing the front lines. 68 airmen were forced to parachute out, landing in the Zhejiang region, right on and behind the front lines of Japanese occupation. Most of them were sheltered by Chinese civilians and smuggled out to safety, but eight airmen ended up as prisoners of war. They will be condemned to death by the Japanese, but five of the sentences are commuted to life imprisonment, one of them will die from starvation in a POW camp, and three will be executed by a firing squad on October 14, 1942. 
They are only a tiny fraction of the victims of Japanese retribution for the raid. In May, they began the Zhejiang Jiangxi campaign, ostensibly to first search for the downed airmen and then capture and destroy any air bases in the region to avoid any more raids on the Japanese islands. In reality, it is a retaliation operation targeting the entire region where the airmen had been held. Father Wendlin Dunker, an American missionary who had received and treated several of the wounded airmen, witnesses the campaign. Like a swarm of locusts, they left behind nothing but destruction and chaos. They shot any man, woman, child, cow, hog, or just about anything that moved. They raped any woman from the ages of 10 to 65, and before burning the town, they thoroughly looted it. None of the humans shot were buried either, but were left to lay on the ground to rot along with the hogs and cows. In early June, parts of the army settle in the town of Nancheng, population 50,000, and begin a reign of terror. Another missionary in the region of the time, Reverend Frederick Maguire, gives witness. For one month, the Japanese remained in Nancheng, roaming the rubble-filled streets and loincloths, much of the time drunk, a good part of the time, and always on the lookout for women. The women and children who did not escape from Nancheng will long remember the Japanese. The women and girls because they were raped time after time by Japanese imperial troops and are now ravaged by venereal disease. The children because they mourn their fathers who are slain in cold blood for the sake of the new order in East Asia. On July 7th, they first plunder whatever hasn't already been stolen in the town, taking even the rails of the railways. Then they burn down the entire town. A Chinese newspaper reports, this planned burning was carried on for three days and the city of Nancheng became charred earth. By now, in mid-August, the campaign is coming to an end. Some 20,000 square miles of arable land, villages, and towns has been destroyed. Around a quarter of a million of civilians are dead, but that is not the end of Japanese revenge. The Biological and Chemical Warfare Unit 731 is part of the operation, and as the army pulls back, they spread cholera, typhoid, plague, and dysentery pathogens by releasing infected fleas or simply poisoning wells and remaining food stores. In the area of Yushan, Kinwa, and Futsin alone, 300 pounds of paratyphoid and anthrax is left in contaminated food and used to poison the wells. It remains unclear how many tens or possibly hundreds of thousands of Chinese fall victim to the pathogens. A quarter away across the globe to the west, Hundreds of thousands of people are still under siege. By the time the Wehrmacht reached and started besieging Leningrad 11 months ago, more than 2 million civilians were trapped in the city. Of them, 400,000 were children and over 700,000 other non-working dependents like the elderly and infirm. Only 636,283 of over 3 million civilians left the city. That fairly low rate of evacuation for a city that would clearly be surrounded and besieged was due to a combination of the speed of the German advance and deliberate policy by the Soviets to leave some civilians, ready or not, to defend the city, muddling by the administrators of evacuation and failure by some Leningraders to evacuate when ordered. Not only were many children left in the city, those who were evacuated were often taken to places that lay in the direct path of the German advance. When this became known, scores of mothers gathered at city administrative buildings to demand to be allowed to bring back their children, shouting in chorus, bring back our children. Better to have them die here together with us than to have them killed God knows where. Fearing general panic, the Communist Party ordered city administrators to forbid such rescue missions and to issue false statements about the children's safety to, quote, liquidate all provocative rumors, unquote, about the truth. Not everyone bought into the propaganda, though, so when a second round of evacuations were announced in August 1941, many mothers refused to let their children go. They were not entirely wrong. Even in August, trainloads of children were still being sent south instead of southeast, only to be caught up in the fighting with thousands dying in German aerial attacks and artillery barrages. 
For those who stayed behind came the siege, and soon it was winter when the high population density proved fatal as all supply lines were cut off with thousands starving to death daily. The children were especially vulnerable and died in very high numbers. Yet others were orphaned, left in apartments with the corpses of dead parents and relatives to then be collected by the volunteers doing the dead flats rounds to recover them. Those under 13 were distributed to improvised orphanages set up around the city, while the 13-year-olds and older were put to work in the still-functioning industry or to aid the maintenance of the sieges. By the end of the winter 1942, 170,000 children of the originally 400,000 were no longer trapped in the city, most of them dead, but a few had been evacuated over the ice roads on Lake Laduga. Through all of this, month after month, week after week, day after day, for almost a year, the German forces surrounding the city and the Luftwaffe have been bombarding the city. Since early summer, huge naval guns on railway cars have taken over most of the heavy lifting, lobbing massive explosive ordnance into the city at irregular intervals. It's a deliberate tactic to fulfill Hitler's outspoken goal to eradicate the entire Leningrad population, but to do so without possible adverse reactions of the Wehrmacht men. Back in 1941, they had shown signs of being demoralized by witnessing the flows of wretched, starving refugees and the mass liquidation of civilians. Then Commander-in-Chief Walter von Brauschitz's response was to suggest that soldiers be spared the psychological strain of killing women and children by making sure the city was rid of its inhabitants by murdering them through air attacks, minefields, and long-distance artillery, saying that even then a large part of the civilian population will perish, but at least not right in front of our eyes. Now in August 1942, despite this incessant mortal rain of explosives, life in the city has returned to a certain new normality. Power has been restored in some parts, the tram cars are running again since already April, and in May some schools reopen. Food is still scarce, but the Red Army has been able to somewhat secure a section of Lake Ladiga so that at least a trickle of supplies can be brought into the city. The mental toll on the population is still enormous, though. A young woman, Olga Grechina, was actively working to support the city defense for months, digging trenches, running supplies, and such things. Early summer, she began training to become a primary school teacher, and will later write how she's so exhausted that she can't stay awake during her training, sitting at the back of the classroom and sleeping instead. I woke rarely and couldn't write or remember anything. Luckily, there were no exams. I would have failed them. There were a couple of nice girls there, but I spoke to them robotically. I think they thought that I was mentally handicapped. And this was actually true since I remember nothing from June 1942. I don't remember what I ate, who I saw, or any other details of my life then. I didn't feel that I was dying, but that I was already dead. The supply line over Lake Ladoga also enables a renewed evacuation campaign that concludes now in August 1942. The goal has been to get all dependents, children and otherwise, out of the city. It is a success, with over a million people taken out with boats and ferries from May to August. Combined with the high death toll of the past year and the conscription of almost every able-bodied male, the city's population has now declined from around 3.5 million before the siege to 637,000, three quarters of whom are women. The city feels like a ghost town, but the remaining children of Leningrad are finally safe. Those remaining, not children, are haggard, tired, and many probably despondent. They are determined to hold out, and on August 9th, they get a massive morale boost, which for their German assailants is just as much a demoralizing lesson in the power of art. In my episode about Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich from a couple of days ago, I told you how he started work on his Seventh Symphony as the Germans advanced on them, then besieged the city. He pours his experiences and impressions of the fighting into the music that he writes, concluding a bombastic piece of heroica after he himself and his wife is evacuated in October 41. Earlier in March this year, it premiered across the Allied world to mixed critical reviews but massive popular acclaim. 
During the London premiere, the announcer said that, I am sure you will agree that the music tells a story of sublime heroism, of unquenchable faith in victory. And now, on August 9th, Symphony No. 7 premieres again, in Leningrad itself. It is played by a hodgepodge of musicians scrambled around the only remaining orchestra, the Leningrad Radio Orchestra under Karl Eliasberg. It is broadcast live throughout the city with large speakers so that all remaining Leningraders, and even the Germans in their distance, can hear it. Although the performance is marred by too few musicians, a lack of proper rehearsals, and missing instruments, the inhabitants of Leningrad give the performance an hour-long standing ovation. An even more lasting impression is left on the Wehrmacht. One German soldier will later recall what he feels. Who are we bombing? We will never be able to take Leningrad because the people here are selfless. Symphony No. 7 will become somewhat of a Soviet anti-fascist anthem and is often associated with the celebration of Stalinism. But posthumously published words shared only in private by Shostakovich during his lifetime tell us what he really intended and remind us that in what Timothy Snyder has dubbed the Bloodlands, suffering never comes from one source alone. I feel eternal pain for those who were killed by Hitler but no less pain for those killed on Stalin's orders. I suffer for everyone who was tortured, shot, or starved to death. There were millions of them in our country before the war with Hitler began. Never forget. <laughs>